Hello and welcome to Integrated Case Studies. My name is Dr. Craig. Uh, thank you for joining me for our week three asynchronous lecture. Uh, the topic for today is going to be pain and pain scales. And so you'll notice this piggybacks off of last week's uh, asynchronous lecture and it has a, a very heavy focus on the nervous system. Um, it also has a very heavy focus on uh, a few different outcome measures that are important for you to understand. Uh, visual analog scale being one and the SF36 being another. Uh, and so I, I split it up into, I split sort of the nervous system and the, and the uh, perception of pain into two lectures because it is quite a large topic. There's full professions that are based on just understanding this and, and working with uh, chronic pain versus acute pain, uh, which are managed very differently from a rehab perspective. Uh, and so I thought it'd be helpful to kind of split split these uh, two lectures um, just to give respect to the amount of information that we're going over. And so we're going to go over uh, a number of different concepts uh, with regards to pain. And we're going to look at uh, pain scales because pain is truly a subjective experience, meaning, uh, you know, you're, you're asking someone's experience with it. And it's very hard to actually get any sort of objective understanding of how a person is managing with pain or what kind of pain they're even in without just asking them outright. And so we try to objectify these sorts of things by um, putting scales and questionnaires to it. And so we'll, we'll talk more about that um, later on in the lecture today. You'll notice that the uh, reference to the textbook is chapters 12 to 14, uh, similar to last week. And again, there, it's not directly relatable to this lecture. Uh, that's just where you're going to find more information about the nervous system. Okay. I'm going to include a number of figures in this lecture and a number of uh, a couple of videos that I want you to watch. Uh, and so those will be helpful for you as well when we talk about sort of the gate control theory of pain. Today, we're gonna to discuss all things pain. Uh, we're gonna look at some classification systems. We're gonna look at neurological processing. We're gonna talk about some referred pain. Uh, and then we will talk about chronic and acute pain a little bit more in depth and the gate control theory of pain, which you've likely experienced or learned about in previous uh, physiology classes. Once we're done talking about pain, then we're gonna talk about a couple of different outcome measures or different scales that you can use, specifically the visual analog scale or the VAS. Uh, and the SF36, or the short form 36, and the short form 16. Pain can be very complex, uh, and it can be classified by a number of different strategies. Uh, you can talk about pain in terms of the region of the body that you're experiencing it. So is it chest pain? Is it low back pain? Is it neck pain? You can also talk about pain in terms of what systems it's affecting in the body. Uh, we can talk about joint pain like arthritis. We can talk about visceral pain. We can talk about neurological pain. We can talk about musculoskeletal pain. Uh, so looking at what system of the body we're looking, we're dealing with. We can also talk about the duration of pain. So as we talk, as we discussed last week, chronic, subacute, acute, uh, those are good indicators. We can also talk about the frequency of pain, whether it's intermittent, whether it's persistent, if it's post-exertional or post-motor vehicle accident, or if it's an isolated incident, uh, that can be helpful to know sort of the cause of it. We can also discuss the intensity of the pain. So is it mild, moderate, severe? How is that changing over time? Uh, we, we'll, we'll, we will look at a couple of outcome measures that can help you identify that today. And then you can look at the etiology or the cause of the pain. Is it if infectious? Is it a cancerous lesion? Is it arthritis? Uh, that can give you a lot of information on appropriate treatment strategies, whether there's any exercise that is uh, contraindicated or more indicated, that sort of thing. So it's important to know what classification we're looking at. A lot of times uh, we will classify it in each of these systems. Uh, and that can be just a much more vivid description of what we're dealing with uh, on a person by person level. There's also a number of different types of pain that your body can perceive. So you can have neuropathic pain, you can have mechanical pain, you can have nociceptive pain. Uh, there's chemical, there's, there's temperature, all types of diff all different types of pain. And we discussed a number of those mechanoreceptors uh, last week.
No susceptive pain, just a, a quick little definition here for you. This is pain that's caused by stimulation of peripheral nerves. Um, this can be in the form of thermal, mechanical, chemical irritation. These are sort of the most common painful stimuli that we experience from the periphery that enter into the central nervous system. Okay, so experiencing pain is a process. There are a lot of neurological systems involved with processing pain. Um, but in essence, what happens is we, we experience the pain in the periphery. Okay. So we have pain receptors in, let's say, we'll, we'll say with our hand, if you touch a hot surface, you've got pain receptors in the hand and that encounters a, a, a hot, a hot surface or the stimulus. Okay. That's going to stimulate uh, thermal receptors. And those thermal receptors are going to stimulate that first order neuron or the first order nerve that's going to take that signal to the central nervous system or into the spinal cord. Okay. When you touch that hot surface, there is going to be a action potential that is created. Okay. That action potential is going to travel along that sensory nerve in through that dorsal root ganglion into the central nervous system. Once it's in the central nervous system, or once it's in the spinal cord, it's going to synapse onto that second order neuron, okay? And that second order neuron is what's going to travel up and into the, the brain stem and then into the brain, into the thalamus, which is where it synapses onto that third order neuron that's going to travel to the somatosensory cortex. So we're gonna discuss that process in detail over the next couple of, um, over the next couple of slides. But if I had to summarize the pain process in uh, sort of three steps or three to five steps, <laughs> the painful stimulus is encountered in the periphery. It travels to the central nervous system through the first order neuron. The second order neuron takes it from the, uh, the second order neuron takes it from the spinal cord to the thalamus. So it ascends through the ascending tract to the thalamus where it synapses onto a third order neuron or the end effector neuron, which takes it to the somatosensory cortex. This image is vitally important for you to understand. Okay, this is how we sense anything in, in, in essence. Okay, you've got two systems. You got the spinal thalamic tract and you've got the dorsal column system, okay? These are two separate pain pathways that transmit different information. The spinal thalamic tract, that transmits pain and temperature sensation, okay? The dorsal column system, that transmits your fine touch and your proprioception. Can anyone think why having two different pathways can be important clinically and how we can use that to our advantage. Well, clinically, if someone has difficulty sensing temperature regulation, okay, let's say they touch a hot surface or a cold surface and they can't tell the temperature, likely we're having a trouble in the spinal thalamic tract. If that's the case, their fine touch and proprioception might be totally intact because that takes a totally different path to the brain, okay? So think of it kind of like two different highways. You've got the 401 and you've got the 407. If you need to get to the, if you need to get to downtown Toronto from Ontario Tech um, in, in North Campus, are you gonna take the 407 or are you gonna take the 401? The two different pathways to the same sort of uh, and the goal or the somatosensory cortex. So let's start with the spinal thalamic tract, okay? And this is where we're going to sense pain and temperature control. You get a painful stimulus or you touch a sharp object in your hand, that first order neuron is gonna sense that pain. It's going to send it through the uh, dorsal root ganglion, okay? And then it's going to synapse onto that second order neuron um, in the spinal cord. Once it synapses on that second order neuron, what happens with the spinal thalamic tract specifically is that second order neuron crosses, crosses the spinal cord at the level of the spinal cord. 
it ascends through the spinal thalamic tract. It goes through the midbrain. There's no synapse at the midbrain and it enters into the thalamus where it synapses with that third order neuron. That third order neuron transmits that signal to the somatosensory cortex. And now since it was our hand that we touched that painful stimulus on, it's going to send it to an area of the somatosensory homunculus that corresponds to the hand, okay? The somatosensory homunculus we discussed last, um, last week and essentially a map of the somatosensory cortex of where certain areas of your body are represented within the brain. So that's the spinal thalamic tract. As you can see, it's the second order neuron that crosses to the other side of the body. And you'll notice that information coming in, this is from the right side, this is from the right hand coming in through the right side of the spinal cord, and it's always sensed on the left side of the brain. Okay, so sensory information is always processed on the opposite side of the brain to the body. The dorsal column system, so let's say uh, proprioceptive information, it enters through, again, the dorsal root ganglion. It synapses on the dorsal horn of the spinal cord and it ascends. So as you can see, it does not synapse with a second order neuron here. It ascends to the medulla and this is through the dorsal column system. In the medulla, it will synapse with that second order neuron. At this point, that second order neuron will cross the spinal cord at the level of the medulla and it will ascend to the thalamus and then send the information to the somatosensory cortex through that third order neuron. Important things to distinguish between these two uh, tract systems, the spinal thalamic tract, the second, the first order neuron synapses at the level of the spinal cord, okay? In the dorsal column system, it actually ascends the spinal cord to the medulla and the synapse happens at the level of the medulla, which is in the brain stem. Another thing to recognize is the second order neuron or the green neuron in both of these images is the neuron that desiccates or that transfers from one side of the body to the other, okay? Now in the spinal thalamic tract, this happens at the level of the spinal cord. In the dorsal column system, this happens at the level of the um, medulla. I know that that's a lot of information <laughs> and I think you can understand why I didn't include it in last week's presentation, but I want you just to go through and understand the differences between these two systems, okay? And in a few slides, I'm gonna give you a video that has an absolutely beautiful description of this um, with images that are drawn out as well. So please, please, please make sure you go through that. Now, I think you can understand that pain can be very confusing. And from an anecdotal perspective, you've probably injured yourself in the past uh, and you know that it can be a minor injury and feel like one of the worst things you've ever experienced and it can be a major injury and not be so painful right uh, so it is this sort of multifactorial experience uh, it can be short-lived or it can be a long-term injury it can be something that's bothering you just at a local specific area or it can be uh, systemic and and, and um, affect the whole body or pain can even be referred from one area to another so let's say you have a headache that can be happening in the cervical spine and just referring to the head. So it can be very, very confusing to identify the areas, uh, identify the causative agent. And so we need to take what's called a biopsychosocial approach to pain because there are multiple factors that we need to consider. This slide gives you a bit more depth in the understanding of acute, subacute and chronic pain. So. Uh, as we mentioned last week, acute pain is anything that, ha that has occurred within the last three months. It's typically from some sort of specific injury, um, and it typically disappears within that three-month period. Once tissue damage repairs, you'll get significant improvement and then uh, marked improvement over time. 
Acute injuries would be, let's say something like you roll your ankle or you've uh, had a, what's called a foosh injury, which is a fall on the outstretched hand. Yeah, fell, sorry, fall on the outstretched hand where you could injure your hand or your forearm. Uh, it's short-term damage and it's going to recover within a short amount of time. Subacute is when things have lingered a little bit longer than six weeks uh, and they're still working within that acute phase. Okay, so it's a subset of acute pain. Um, some things will recover within six weeks. Some things linger a little bit longer. Uh, I like to use back pain as an example here. Most back pain episodes, if it's a mechanical issue, uh, and if you've sort of quote unquote, thrown your back out, usually it will be taken care of in less than a subacute phase. So less than six weeks. Chronic pain, on the other hand, is more than three months. Typically chronic pain starts with an acute episode of pain but it doesn't resolve within that three month time period. There's often more psychosocial and psychological uh, stressors that are contributing to pain in this chronic phase. And this can complicate our understanding of the injury. This can complicate our decision-making in terms of treatment, and it can actually impact diagnostic criteria. Treatments that are effective in the acute phase are often not effective in the chronic phase. This is because you've got different types of inflammation that are happening. Uh, you've got different pain perceptions. You've got different understandings and expectations from the client or the patient. Uh, and so there is this complex interaction between psychological, physiological, uh, and behavioral components within the management that can complicate chronic pain conditions, okay? There are literally medical specialties that just deal with chronic pain. It is a very, very complex uh, issue within healthcare. Referred pain. Referred pain is very, very interesting. Uh, there's lots of research in this area, but I still think there's lots of space to expand our understanding. If you're interested in looking at um, neurological pain and, and uh, pain perception and pain understanding in individuals, this could be an interesting area for you. So referred pain is when a painful stimulus is, incur is occurring in one area, but it's perceived in another area. So a great example of this would be cervical genic headaches, um, where headaches are actually occurring due to pain in the neck. And we're gonna discuss that in just a minute. You can also have a uh, visceral referral, which is when a, a great example is if you have issues in the gallbladder, you can have gallstones or some type of other uh, issue, infection, whatnot. You can get referral to the shoulder. Um, and this is a really interesting one clinically because what happens is when the gallbladder is active, the person will get shoulder pain. So uh, let's say they eat a, a, a meal that's very high in fat or very high in cholesterol content. The gallbladder is going to be highly active. And so when the gallbladder is highly active, that's when you're going to get pain. So uh, a very funny clinical uh, pearl is when, if somebody has shoulder pain and they have no reason for it, there's no mechanism of injury, there's no overt um, musculoskeletal pain or complication ask them, do you notice that that pain comes on after you eat, say, a, a high fat content meal? They might say, yes, that can be an indicator that the gallbladder is, is problematic. So referred pain, it can be when organ pain mimics um, joint or musculoskeletal pain. That's, for example, with the, with the gallbladder, and we kind of call that viscerosomatic referral. It can also be when muscular pain mimics other muscular pain, and that's called musculoskeletal referral. A couple of prime examples are cervical genic headaches. Uh, and so referred pain can come from the suboccipital muscles, it can come from the mastoid, or from the upper trapezius or upper fibers of the traps. So the suboccipitals are muscles that anchor your skull to your first two vertebrae. They are innervated by um, the same nerve roots, C1, C2, uh, that innervate the scalp or the dermatome for the scalp, okay? So when the, um, 
when the subox suboccipitals are tight, or if you're having a painful stimulus to the suboccipitals, uh, it can be sensed as the dermatomal distribution shown uh, here on the bottom right. So uh, if people have really tight suboccipitals, if you palpate them and you can cause a painful stimulus that comes up and wraps around the back of the head. Same thing is true for the upper fibers of the traps. In the upper right, you can see uh, there are some trigger points within the trapezius, or sorry, the uh, upper traps that can refer up and around the head and even cause headaches behind the eye. So clinically, I want you to think, how does this occur? Like how does referred pain actually happen? And there's a couple of there's a couple of reasons for it. This is a description of that or, organ or visceral referral. Okay, so the the reason it happens is the nociceptive afferents from viscera enter the spinal cord at the same spinal segmental level as the nociceptive afferents from the skin, the muscle, and the joints. Okay, so for example, let's go for the gallbladder. Like I said, so the gallbladder has this. The nerves that um, innervate the gallbladder enter the spinal cord at the same level as the dermatomal distribution over the right shoulder. So if the gallbladder is overactive, you can get this weird referral pattern over the right shoulder uh, after the individual, say, eats a fatty meal, as I said. So the reason for this type of referral pattern is you've got con convergence of neurological impulses onto a common nerve that can be misrepresentative or misrepresented as coming from a different area. Let's talk about the suboccipitals again. So the suboccipitals are innervated by the suboccipital nerve, which involves the upper cervical nerve roots. This is, this is true also for the skin over the back of the head. So the convergence of these signals onto the same nerve roots can be misinterpreted by the brain and result in re that referral pattern experience. Secondly, the greater and the lesser occipital nerves travel through the suboccipitals. So if we go back a slide, underneath the suboccipitals is where that greater occipital nerve and lesser occipital nerve emerge. And so if those suboccipitals are very tight, they can compress those nerves and cause uh, referral pain into the back of the skull. These types of sort of misrepre misrepresentations of the pain signal, they follow typical patterns uh, and clinically we can predict those patterns. So they can help us to uh, A, be more accurate in our diagnosis, understand what we wanna treat, uh, and we can look at these referral patterns for clinical insight. Now, the next thing we're gonna talk about is the gate control theory of pain. And I'm almost certain you've talked about this again in some sort of um, neurophys class, but we're gonna review it. And I want you to watch this video. This video is excellent for a very simple review of the pain pathways. So the, um, the track systems, but it's also a good descriptor of what we're looking at in terms of the gate control theory of pain. So. The gate control theory of pain is how painful sensations can be blunted or reduced by activating non-painful sensations. And this helps to override that painful stimulus. So let's take the example of, if we look on the left here, let's take the example of you, everybody's done this, or at least I have many times, I did this weekend, uh, but hitting your thumb with a hammer by accident. Okay, it's obviously gonna cause a painful stimulus. It's going to activate uh, pain receptors, and it's going to send a nerve signal down that primary neuron into the dorsal root ganglion, and then into the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. Okay, so that's the primary um, neuron or the first order neuron. That pain signal is going to transmit from that first order neuron to the second order neuron. It's going to desiccate or cross the spinal cord. And it's going to ascend through that spinal phalanic tract. 
okay? As it ascends through that spinal thalamic tract, it's going to synapse onto the third order neuron at the level of the thalamus, okay? So it's going to synapse here, it's going to send that painful stimulus up to the somatosensory cortex through that third order neuron, okay? What happens is that if we backtrack a moment here, that first order neuron, when it enters into the dorsal, um, uh, the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, it releases substance P, which is a neurotransmitter that initiates that second order neuron to, uh, to fire. And that's the neurotransmitter that communicates that signal. Okay. Now, if you slam your thumb with a hammer and then you immediately start to rub it, which is seems to be almost a reflex for us, that deep touch can actually inhibit that pain stimulus, okay? And this is the gate control theory of pain. So when you apply deep pressure or deep touch to your thumb, you're going to activate the Piscinian corpuscles, okay? When you activate the Piscinian corpuscle, you're gonna activate that, that first order neuron, which is going to travel uh, to the spinal cord, enter through that uh, dorsal root again. And the if you remember from the previous slide, deep touch is transmitted through the dorsal, um, the dorsal column. Okay, as opposed to the spinal thalamic tract. So it will ascend, it will synapse on a second order neuron, which is going to ascend through the dorsal column to the brain stem. At the brain stem, then you're going to have uh, then you're going to have that synapse to the second order neuron, which is going to go to the uh, the thalamus. And this is where it can sort of mediate or inhibit the signal. Okay, so you're rubbing your thumb, that signal initiates um, the Piscinian corpuscle, which is going to travel to the thalamus, and you're going to go to get an inhibition signal to that third order neuron, which takes the pain signal to the brain. So this is the first area that you're going to have inhibition of that signal. So it's going to reduce the firing rate and reduce the pain experience. At the same time, if we go back to the level of the spinal cord, okay, and we zoom in on it, this is the area called the substantia gelatinosa. And so what you have is the, uh, the, the green nerve here. This is the original primary neuron from the painful stimulus, okay? And this is where it's going to uh, synapse onto the secondary neuron, and that's going to send the, pen, send the painful stimulus up to the thalamus. The purple neuron here, this is that uh, the inhibitory or the gate control neuron, and it attaches to an interneuron. This interneuron also attaches to the second order neuron for the painful stimulus, and it can reduce the transmission here. It it uh, it's sort of uh, releases encephalons. Encephalons are the inhibitory interneuron uh, neurotransmitter, and so those encephalons they will reduce the amount of substance P that's reduced on or that's produced by the um, presynaptic terminal. It's also going to attach to the postsynaptic terminal and reduce the firing rate of that second order neuron that's transmitting the painful stimulus, okay? Now, again, please watch this video. Watch it a couple of times because it will explain that in, in detail. But what I want you to take away from this is that the gate control theory is this idea that by using deep touch, you can inhibit that painful stimulus. Okay, so you can rub the thumb to create this inhibitory uh, signal, and that inhibitory signal happens at the level of the substantia gelatinosa, and it also happens at the level of the thalamus to reduce the painful stimulus that the somatosensory cortex perceives. So the substantia gelatinosa, this is the gate, essentially, um, for that painful stimulus, and it can reduce the amount of stimulus that that second order neuron experiences.
Next, we're gonna move on to discuss the visual analog, visual analog scale uh, and the short form health survey or the SF36. We're gonna look at these as outcome measures primarily for pain management, uh, but they do have applications in different, different areas of clinical practice. So the objective for you here is to be able to identify and understand the use of the visual analog scale and the SF36 for pain management, uh, to be able to score them, to understand, <coughs> excuse me, to understand how they correlate to other measures as well. The visual analog scale I use in everyday practice, uh, it's a common psychometric response scale uh, with widespread applications. You can use it for pain, you can use it for um, exertion. It's very simple and it's adaptable to a wide range of populations and a wide range of settings. So it is a measure of pain intensity and pain experience, and it attempts to objectify it by asking the individual to rate their pain. So it is highly subjective, okay? And you need to make sure that you sort of gauge the individual's response, okay? Because all individuals have different pain tolerances and all individuals will have different intentions on how they are answering you. So for example, if you say to somebody, if you're having a, you know, a jovial joking conversation with someone and you say, okay, back to, back to the topic, like how bad is your ankle hurt? And they go, oh, it's a 10 out of 10. And that doesn't really match up with what you're observing with how they're walking or with how they're talking about their pain. Sometimes there can be an exaggerated uh, response there. On the other side of things, if somebody is very resilient to pain and, and has a very high pain tolerance, they might underplay the amount of pain that they're in and they might call it a two out of 10 because they're, you know, it's not affecting them psychologically quite as much. So you need to understand the intentions, you need to understand each individual's pain tolerance. This is the vertical visual analog scale. There's also a horizontal, which is more trans, um, more traditional and I see more often, um, but the vertical one fit nicely on this slide. So the, the horizontal will be on the, the next one. Uh, and the visual analog scale, it's this continuous scale as opposed to a discrete scale. Uh, continuous meaning they can put their line anywhere to indicate the amount of pain that they're having. So it's a scale from, no pain to the worst pain imaginable. And the individual can sort of make a tick anywhere along this line to indicate the amount of pain that they have. This is most appropriate for uh, assessing within individual change or from if, if myself, it's if let's say I, I scored this last week and it was here uh, and next, this week it's way down here, that's a good measure. So that's a within individual change. It's good because it takes less than like 10 seconds to complete. There's really no training required to administer this or to complete it. Um, and it has high cultural adaptations, high cross-cultural adaptations. So anybody can really understand this. Okay. The biggest problem is right here. It is highly subjective. Okay. What is each person's 10 out of 10? And this is really important to ask them and to explain what is your worst pain imaginable? Um, because everybody's gonna be different, right? Everybody's only, ex everybody's experienced their own perceptions with pain and everybody's going to differ in their worst pain imaginable. So there is some research that suggests that the visual analog scale is a superior metric um, to its discrete counterpart and discrete means uh, there are specific numbers that you have to select. So from zero to 10, how bad is your pain? That's a discrete scale. Whereas this one um, is just a line, okay? So uh, there is some research to suggest that people aren't as impacted by a continuous scale as they are with the discrete one. So the way that you score this is the individual will mark on the line. And let's say this is a 10 centimeter line, then I can measure from zero to the mark. And the nice thing here is you, you aren't just confined to that zero to 10 scale. Uh, if they mark it at say 5.5 centimeters, then it's a uh, 55 millimeters uh, or you know 78 millimeters, 23 millimeters, whereas a, a, a discrete scale will only be zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 
And the numeric rating scale, this is the name we give to that discrete scale. So um, there is a clear correlation between how people score on uh, the visual analog scale and the um, numeric rating scale. Numeric rating scale and the visual analog scale are often given together. You give a line with the numbers. And so you can go from zero pain to 10, which is sort of worst pain imaginable. And there's different versions that you can use, which I like. Uh, so for children, often you'll see these happy faces to sad faces, and they can sort of uh, represent their represent their pain visually. You can also use a discrete scale where, you know, anywhere from strongly disagree to strongly agree. So how does the uh, visual analog scale compare to the uh, numeric rating scale? They're rather similar, uh, but if you are looking to to compare between moderate pain on the visual analog scale will correlate to greater than 30 millimeters. Severe pain will correlate to greater than uh, 54 millimeters. And uh, the literature suggests that males and females score very equivalent. So there's no need to distinguish between males and females on those measures. In general, a zero correlates to no pain. A one to three corresponds to mild pain, four to six is moderate, seven to nine is severe, and 10 out of 10 pain, or if they're totally on the one side of that visual analog scale, that is the worst pain imaginable. Typically this is reserved for people who should be at the hospital, are bedridden, or it can be an exaggerated response uh, as I described before. If it is an exaggerated response, it can be important to document that. Um, oftentimes in my clinical notes, I will put patient reported 10 out of 10, uh, suspected exaggerated response based on observation and other um, historical findings. So how do we determine if there's a significant amount of change in their pain level? Like, do we care if, is one centimeter of change important? Does it need to be five centimeters? Uh, plenty of researchers asked this question, and we've sort of returned some interesting data on what we should be looking for. And the term that we use for this is the minimum clinically significant difference. Okay, This is the term given to the amount of change we would attribute to an important or significant finding. Generally, it's dependent on um, the area that you're looking at. So low back pain is going to differ from a rotator cuff condition and uh, RA or rheumatoid arthritis uh, is gonna change from emergency room visits. So there's research in all different areas. People will look at a specific condition, but for rehab purposes in general, what we wanna say, what we wanna see is a change in 20 millimeters or more to indicate significant improvement or significant aggravation of symptoms. Okay, so 20 millimeters or two centimeters is what we look at in general for rehab. The strengths of the visual analog scale are that it's very simple to implement. Um, it's adaptable to a wide range of clinical scenarios and populations. And it's been used for many, many years. So we've got tons and tons of normative data it's well understood. Uh, it can be applied across really any sort of population. Uh, and it, it's a great scale visually, and it's a great scale uh, from an objective measure as well. Now, I'm always weary of research that just bases information on the visual analog scale because there is a, it is highly subjective. So one of the major limitations is that it's <laughs> very subjective. People need sort of a, uh, a baseline level of cognition to complete it. Uh, so if there is any sort of cognitive or motor impairments, they might be prone to not being able to complete the visual analog scale. And unfortunately it can't be administered by telephone, which sort of does limit its usefulness in research, uh, but that's where you would use the, uh, the NRS of the new numeric uh, rating scale, numeric pain rating scale instead. The last outcome measure that I want to discuss is the short form uh, health survey or the SF36. This is a much more in-depth health survey. 
Uh, I suggest that I'll give you a link to this survey and I suggest that you go through and complete it on your own just to see how involved it is. But the SF36 is a measure of health related quality of life. Okay, it's a multi-purpose generic health survey form that has wide utility in research and in clinical settings. It's a patient reported survey of the patient's overall health. It's been validated at measuring um, eight health outcomes. So there are um, eight health outcomes across two categories and it yields an overall quality of life score that can be used uh, to indicate overall health. And it can also be broken down into its components to assess certain areas of functioning. There is also a SF-16, which is another health outcome form. It's just a short formed version of this, okay? Uh, and again, I'll give you a copy of that uh, survey on Canvas. The SF-36 can be divided into physical health aspects and mental health aspects. So that's the two different categories that we're looking at, physical health and mental health. The physical health component can be broken down further into four areas of functioning. And this includes physical functioning, physical role, bodily pain, and the social role. When we average the score in these four dimensions, we get what's called the physical component score. And um, this is how we sort of assess, this, this is how we use the SF36 to assess their, uh, basically their physical, physical uh, abilities, their physical functioning um, and whatnot. So this combined with that mental health score uh, can give us an overall, uh, overall understanding of what's happening with the individual. So the mental health score, this can be broken down into mental health, emotional role, vitality, and general health perceptions. And these are the four subcategories of the mental health uh, component score. So we look at the average of those four and we get that mental health component score. The overall health score, this is going to be our average of the uh, physical component score and the mental component score. The interpretation of this outcome measure goes from zero to 100 and a score of zero is equivalent to maximum disability, whereas a score of 100 is equivalent to no disability. So the higher the value, the better the individual's health and functioning is. This, <laughs> this outcome measure is an absolute um, sort of a nightmare to score. And so typically you will use software to do this, but I, I've given you these scoring um, tables on this slide to see how you actually score this. So you look at the item number. So one, two, 20, 22, 34, uh, all of these items within the SF36 are going to be scored based on this uh, criteria. Numbers three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. They will be scored in this regard, and so on and so forth. So what you have to do is you have to go through the SF thirty six, score each of these based on the scoring criteria. Then you have to place them into their different bins. So if we're looking at physical functioning, there's ten items, and so we have to go. Okay, so number three, how is that scored? Okay, so one was equal to a zero, and two was equal to a fifty. So you have to record all of those in. In a, in a chart as well. I'm not gonna make you do this because there is tons of software that you can use. Uh, feel free to check out this hyperlink here, orthotoolkit.com, SF36. Um, and this will score it for you. It makes light work of something that's just very tedious. So from a research perspective, the SF36 is excellent for assessing health-related quality of life. Uh, it's an objective measure. It is well used. If you've done any sort of reading in public health literature, you've definitely come across the SF36. Personally, from a clinical perspective, I use the SF36 for specific questions, okay? So if I'm overtly concerned about somebody's um, social functioning or their 
physical functioning, I'm going to go and use these questions specifically and look how they're, uh, look how they're um, functioning in those areas. I do find that the overall sort of uh, health score is a great way to start a discussion with patients and clients as to why they should be engaging in physical activity. And then you can use the specific questions to show, look, we can help you in these areas of functioning, which is going to bring up your overall health uh, from an objective perspective with the SF36, but also from a subjective perspective to the individual, which is really at the end of the day, what we're looking to improve. As I mentioned, the SF36 has a ton of literature supporting its use. Uh, it's been shown to have very good internal consistency, which means uh, that, that the questions are reliable within the SF36 and they're not dramatically different in terms of their applicability. It has very, it has adequate tests to retest reliability, which refers to the fact that if the same person took it twice, they're going to score the same or at least very similar uh, similarly, when they take it both times, it's got good correlations with other similar health health outcome measures. Uh, it's got good construct validity, meaning that uh, the test has been validated to measure what it's supposed to. So does it really measure what it claims to? Yes, we can say that it, it, it does. It also has adequate criterion validity, uh, which means like how does it measure up to the gold standard? or the best known tests that look at this type of um, characteristic. And so believe it or not, the SF36 isn't the longest health, health outcome measure. So it does match up quite well to gold standard measures. And then it's also adequate uh, to change. So it's got uh, an adequate sensitivity to change, meaning if there's change in the individual, the SF36 will pick it up. And that's all that I had for you today for our lecture. Um, we reviewed a number of complex topics and I really encourage you to watch the videos uh, that I've posted to Canvas and the video that I've posted to this lecture uh, because it, it's very important for you to understand those pain pathways and how pain can be inhibited, okay? Thank you for listening and I hope that you have a fantastic day and fantastic week and we will re reconvene during our next lecture. Take care, everybody.